Straight ahead, Senate showdown. I spoke extensively with both Senator Ted Cruz and Congressman Colin Allred about their tightening race and differences on the issues. Now two days before they go head to head in a debate. Tracking the battlegrounds, there's some movement in some of the key seven states that will help decide the presidential race. Good Sunday morning to you, I'm Jack Fink. Get your fix for Texas politics. Eye on Politics starts now. Hello, hope you're having a great weekend and welcome to Ion Politics. We're going to focus mostly on the Senate showdown between Republican incumbent Ted Cruz and his Democratic challenger, North Texas Congressman Colin Allred. They're set to debate in two days on Tuesday night. And as you're about to see, we spoke with them extensively about their campaigns and the issues. This is the marquee race in Texas, and it is a race that has gotten more competitive. Allred has outraised Cruz again. Third quarter results show Allred hauled in more than $30 million, while Cruz brought in more than $21 million. As we've reported, the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee is injecting millions of dollars into Allred's campaign to help him try to flip this seat. If that happened, it would be a political earthquake in Texas, the first time a Democrat would win in the state in 30 years. The respected Cook political report shifted the race down from likely R to lean R. And Cook's definition of likely R is these races are not considered competitive at this point, but have the potential to become engaged. Lean R means these races are now considered competitive, but one party has an advantage. Allred has been crisscrossing Texas and spent a lot of time in North Texas last week including a stop in Dallas with the chair of the Democratic National Committee chair, Jamie Harrison. We spoke with Allred in Dallas and I asked him about his path to victory. I think that this momentum that we're seeing is a reflection of what we always knew, uh, that this is a close race. Uh, and I think that you know, the national folks are just now maybe coming on board with that. Uh, but I'm incredibly proud of the support that we've gotten uh, from Republicans who I've served with, like Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger. Adam is now a Texan, of course but also of local North Texans uh, like Judge Glenn Whitley and Jason Vialba, who I think are respected figures in the Republican Party, uh, who feel like, you know, listen, uh, we can't have six more years of Ted Cruz in the way that he has not served our state. Let's say you win November 5th and, you know, it comes a time because you got money from the Democratic senatorial campaign, Leader Schumer, uh, leading that effort in part. If you were to win, how do you say no to him when he's strong arming you for a vote and it may not be how you feel because it goes against the state of Texas's interest? Well, this is nothing new for me. I've had congressional races that were you know, of national importance and so national uh, support came in and I'm still been you know, very willing, of course, to say when I disagree and when I think it's not good for Texas and I'll always do that. So I've been that way for six years. It's not an election year promise. I'll hopefully be able to do that in the Senate. I wanted to ask you about uh, Nate Silver's 538 blog said that you voted 100% of the time with President Biden from 2021 to 2023. So where's the disagreement? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think it's kind of interesting. You see some of these things that you know, pick up. At the same time, I'm also being endorsed by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. I'm also winning an award uh, from an independent group being named the most bipartisan Texan in Congress. And so you can cherry pick statistics, and it depends on what vote you're talking about. Because I'm also condemning the Biden administration when I think they're not doing the job on the border. But when you're in uh, the Congress, you are also part of the crafting of legislation. For example, the infrastructure bill. You know, you can call that a vote with President Biden, but I was, it's a bipartisan bill that I helped put together and spring $35 billion uh, to our state. Or the Chips and Science Act. You know, John Cornyn helped push that through in the Senate. Mike McCall on the House side, a Republican. Me on the House side uh, here in Texas. We are benefiting from that tremendously here in Texas. So it depends on how you look at it. Let's talk about border security. I know that um, you were on a video when you ran back in 2017. You called the wall, the border wall, uh, racist. Um, but you told me back in February 2018, I have a problem with the wall, period. I think we as a country cannot allow the symbol of this country to become a wall with barbed wire on top of it. The symbol of our country is the Statue of Liberty and it has to remain that way. And now you're appearing in an ad, one of your ads, and the border wall is right there. So how, how do you square that? How can you be against the wall but then you're shooting an ad in front of it? 
Let's not, let, let's be clear. When people were talking about this, especially back seven, six years ago, we we're talking about more of a symbol than what I consider to be responsible border security. And that's what I've always opposed, is symbols that can make us seem like we're something else. That can also tar be used to target others in Texas to make them feel like they're not welcome here. And that was what I was worried about at the time. That's what I'm still worried about. When we have a conversation about having a secure border, we have to also make sure that we're not doing it in a way that makes folks who are here, who are Latinos or, or others, feel like they are not welcome. And that is a, a continuing concern of mine. But border security, which is my family's from the border, is a different conversation. And I've always said from you know, the first month I was elected and we had a town hall and I was asked about it, that, that physical barriers have a role to play in border security, in addition to technology, personnel, and policy changes. And what did Ted Cruz do when he took down the border bill that we had earlier this year? It was $20 billion for technology to catch fentanyl, for 1,000 new Border Patrol agents, uh, for policy changes to the asylum system to make it so that more folks would be denied asylum at the initial stage and then also making it easier for us to process them faster to get through this backlog that we have. That's actual border security. It's not something that's a symbol trying to target a certain community. Uh, he's been asked about that um, and he has said that he backed H.R. 2, the House bill, uh, the Secure Border Act. Um, and so that provision or that uh, bill that was passed in the House by Republicans, obviously, backed, you know, building more border wall. Uh, is that why you oppose that? No, no. That, that bill was not a serious attempt at border security. And let's, let's be very clear. Border security is going to have to be bipartisan and working on this in a bipartisan way. H.R. 2 was a symbolic bill intended to just have, uh, for people like Ted Cruz to say they support that and then never do anything. If you actually want to get something done, you have to roll up your sleeves and work together. And as you know, the Trump tax cuts, that plan is really going to decide next year what, what happens to it, right? As far as whether they should be allowed to expire or not. Um, do you think that any part of that uh, plan for individual uh, tax rates, corporate tax rates, et cetera, should be eliminated or should be made permanent? Well, listen, I, I definitely think that we need to keep taxes low on the middle class, and I want to see where we can even go further, uh, and that's, that's a focus of mine. I think we'll have a conversation around you know, what is a responsible landing area for taxes on our wealthiest Americans who have done the best uh, in this economy. Uh, and I want to continue to be some of what I've always been in my time in Congress, which is somebody who's very responsive and understands that when our businesses do well, uh, they employ a lot of folks who then are able to take care of their families. And so I'll always stay in touch with our business community in terms of you know, what is actually going to help them be competitive in this global marketplace. Uh, you've supported codifying Roe v. Wade nationally. And Vice President Harris has said she supports ending the Senate filibuster, the 60 vote threshold, to allow for this vote so it would be a simple 51 vote majority. Do you agree with that? Well, first let's talk about uh, what's happening in Texas uh, because it, it is horrific and Texans should know. And I, I come across some Texans who aren't actually fully aware that we don't have any uh, exceptions for rape or incest in our state law here. And 26,000 Texas women have been forced to give birth to their rapist child uh, since Dobbs came down, according to the Houston Chronicle. There are these continuing stories that we hear every single day of families who are forced into uh, you know, unspeakable, really, decisions about whether or not to have to leave their state and, and go somewhere and be treated in a place that they've never been by doctors they've never met at a cost they may not be able to afford or uh, go through something uh, you know, very difficult and ultimately you know, could be tragic for them here at home. Uh, and so this is, to me, Ted Cruz's abortion ban. He's uniquely responsible for this in a way that no other Texas leader uh, could claim to be because he put the judges on the district court, circuit court, and Supreme Court level to do this. He backed state legislators, knowing even in, often in primaries, knowing that they would put in place these laws. He called for and celebrated the Dobbs decision, said it was a massive victory. So you, just to be clear on, on the filibuster issue, you're saying that this should be eliminated, the 60-vote threshold? No. Or, or this what, is a, what would, yeah, I, mean, I mean, is this an example of where it should not be a 60-vote threshold, where this should yeah, be a simple so majority? What, we're actually in an ahistorical period now where the, the filibuster is applied just by saying you object and you know, legislation still moves and everything is subjected to a 60-vote uh, threshold. That's not the history of the Senate, actually. For most of our history, 
Most of the major legislation that we're all familiar with passed on a majority vote in the Senate. And so to me, reforming the filibuster to go back to its traditional role as a speaking filibuster, one where if you want to hold the floor, you can hold it and nothing else moves, but that will there have a cost to that. If you say you object, why do you object? Explain it. And I also think Texans and the American people will then have more of an opportunity to hear what your objection is to a piece of legislation. And to me, the greatest deliberative body in the world was meant for that. While Congressman Allred pointed out he has been endorsed by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, that was for his House seat, not in the Senate race. The Chamber has backed Cruz in this Senate race. Coming up next, Senator Ted Cruz has been saying for months this will be a very competitive race and that he's the Democrats' number one target. What he says is at stake when I on Politics returns. Welcome back to Eye on Politics. We continue now with the Senate showdown. Senator Ted Cruz hopes to win a third term. He recently began a 53-stop bus tour across the Lone Star State, which has included stops in North Texas, including Tarrant County, where he lost in 2018 to Democrat Beto O'Rourke by just over 4,300 votes. We caught up with him at his bus stop in downtown Waxahachie in the Courthouse Square. And I started by asking him about his road to victory and why this race is as competitive as it is. And we're crisscrossing the state. And, and I think this election is going to be about my record versus Colin Allred's record. And I think every election should be about that and about the vision of both candidates for the state. I've spent 12 years fighting every day for 30 million Texans, fighting for jobs, freedom, and security. Jobs is my number one priority. You get jobs through lower taxes, lower regulations, fighting for small businesses. Freedom, protecting the basic constitutional rights of Texans. Free speech, religious liberty, the Second Amendment. And then security, fighting to secure the border, fighting to support law enforcement to keep our families safe. That's a common sense agenda that reflects the values of the people of Texas. On the other hand, Congressman Allred's record has been an extreme left voting record. I hear what you're saying, but the race is still so close. Yeah. I mean, here we are, it's red Texas. Yeah. A Democrat hasn't won statewide in 30 years. Why, what's happening? Why is this so close? Well, listen, we, we, we saw this, we saw this like my, the last time I ran in 2018, that I'm the number one target for national Democrats. Chuck Schumer has been very explicit in this race that I'm his number one target. And he's going to spend over $100 million. He may spend as much as $150 million. Everyone watching TV right now, you see Colin Allred ads, every other ad. Now, it's good for the TV stations, but, but, it, but it, the problem is that much money uh, can impact an election in particular because if you look at Congressman Allred's rec record and his ads, there's a huge disconnect. I had been the leading defender of securing the border for 12 years. I worked hand in hand with President Trump to secure the border and we achieved incredible success. We achieved the lowest rate of illegal immigration in 45 years. So let me ask you on the border yeah. because I hear what you're saying about former President Trump's record and then we saw the influx. And so the problem is that there's no bill that was passed. So it's all up to the presidents and what they decide the mm -hmm. policy is going to be. So where is the Senator Cruz bill on this issue? Well, I've introduced the HR2 in the Senate, the strongest border security but bill that was ever House introduced. Bill. But, but I've introduced it in the Senate. I've also introduced multiple bills in the Senate. And the reason there was no bill when Donald Trump was president is because Colin Allred and the Democrats blocked every bill. Is there not an opportunity though? I mean, you've worked with Democrats before on legislation, on bipartisan legislation. Yeah. So why isn't a single Democrat then, why aren't you working with them on that? Because sadly, when it comes to the national Democrats on open borders, they've become radicalized. Let me ask you about abortion. Yeah. So as you know, Congressman Allred says you, you are to blame <laughs> for the near Texas, the near abortion ban here in Texas and, and these states. You voted for the Supreme Court justices who overturned Roe v. Wade, and you supported the Texas Republicans who in turn passed the law. Why shouldn't you be held accountable for that? Well, listen, once again, that is Congressman Allred's campaign being deceptive. The Texas law was passed by the Texas state legislature, was signed by the governor. I don't serve in the Texas state legislature. I'm not the governor. And, and, and listen, this is important. You look at his ads, he puts me next to two officials in the state government. I serve in the United States Senate, an entirely different body. And, and here's the important thing to understand about what the Supreme Court said in the Dobbs decision. 
The Supreme Court said, listen, abortion is an issue people disagree with. I disagree strongly. People of good faith can look at this issue and come to differing conclusions. They could be pro-choice, they could be pro-life. Texans, Americans disagree on this. And what the Supreme Court said is under our Constitution, the way we resolve issues where we've got good faith disagreements is at the ballot box. On a state ban. Yeah. And I, I hear what you're saying about the legislature, but you're not sitting here disagreeing with their decision, are you? Uh, what I'm saying is it's a decision for the state legislature and it's a decision for the voters of Texas. And by the way, if Colin Allred wants to change those, th those rules, he ought to run for the state legislature. Yeah. Vice President yeah. Harris says she supports ending the filibuster yeah. to pass to codify Roe v. Wade. Uh, where are you on that? I think it's a terrible idea. And it actually re really underscores the stakes of this election if God forbid Kamala Harris is elected president, and if Colin Allred is elected to the Senate. Right now, Chuck Schumer has 49 votes to end the filibuster. The filibuster is the requirement that you need 60 votes to take up major legislation. Colin Allred has promised to be the 50th vote. So if he won, Chuck Schumer would have the votes to end the filibuster. If Schumer ends the filibuster, which he's pledged to do, and Colin Allred would give him the final vote he needs to do it, let me tell you what Schumer would do in January of next year. The first thing he would do is pass S-1. S-1 is the first bill Schumer introduces in every Senate. It is a federal takeover of every election in the country. It strikes down every election integrity law in Texas. It strikes down the photo ID law in Texas. It legalizes ballot harvesting in Texas. The, that would be the first bill Schumer would pass. The second bill he would pass would be to add two new states to the union, D.C. and Puerto Rico. They would do that because they believe that would elect four new Democrat senators and give Democrats permanent control of the Senate. The third thing they would do is grant amnesty and immediate voting rights to every illegal alien in America. There are about 20 to 30 million illegal Im immigrants in America. There are two to three million in Texas. If that happened, Texas would immediately turn blue. If that happened, every statewide elected official would lose the next election. The governor would lose, the lieutenant governor would lose, the attorney general would lose. We have nine Republican Supreme Court justices. All nine would lose and Texas would become California. So a decision has to be made yeah. Yeah. about making the Trump tax cuts from 2017 permanent. Yeah. So where are you on that? Where are you on uh, Trump's plan for no tax on tips, no tax yeah. on social security, yeah. no tax on overtime? And how are you going to pay for it? Yeah, so, so, so let's take them one at a time. In terms of taxes, I, I was one of the key authors of the 2017 tax cuts, the biggest tax cut in the generation. And it produced incredible economic results. It produced the lowest rate of unemployment in 50 years, the lowest rate of Hispanic unemployment ever, the lowest rate of African American unemployment ever. That, that is a big part of the reason I think the American people are going to reelect President Trump and give us a Republican Senate and House is because of that economic prosperity. It was on no taxes on tips. I'm actually the lead author of the legislation in the Senate to have no taxes on tips. I will say it was Donald Trump's idea. He actually announced it at a rally in, in Las Vegas. And when I heard it, I said, that's a fantastic idea. And I went to my team. I said, let's draft that right now. Let's file it. When I filed it, my legislation for no taxes on tips has bipartisan support. Both of the Democrat senators from Nevada immediately joined my legislation. I also very much agree with, with no taxes on Social Security. It doesn't make any sense that you spend your entire working life paying into Social Security, earning Social Security, and then when you start to get paid it, the government turns around and taxes it back from you. That doesn't make any sense. In terms of how you pay for it, you know, it's an interesting thing in the 2017 tax cuts. The Democrats, every Democrat voted no. Every Democrat in the House voted no. Every Democrat in the Senate voted no. And they said at the time, they said, if we cut taxes in 2017, they said federal revenue is going to plummet. Well, it turns out they were wrong. Their predictions, you can go back and look. That's what they said. You know what happened the next year? Federal revenue went up. If you want to watch the full cruise at All Red interviews, we left nothing out. Go to our website, cbsnewstexas.com, and scroll down to Jack Fink interviews. Coming up, there's been some movement in the presidential race in some of the key battleground states when Eye on Politics comes right back.
We are tracking the battleground states in the presidential race, and there has been some movement this past week as the races are still growing tighter. Hard to believe. So let's take a look at the real clear politics average of polls. We're going to start in Arizona, as we always do, where former President Donald Trump leads Vice President Kamala Harris by 0.9 percentage points. That's down from last week. In Nevada, Harris has increased her lead over Trump ever so slightly to one percentage point, and this is the largest margin out of all seven states. In Georgia, the race has tightened as well, where Trump's lead over Harris has fallen from last week to 0.8 percentage points. Now to the Midwest, and we start with Wisconsin, where Harris's lead has shrunk from last week and leads Trump by 0.4 percentage points. But some of the big news this week is now in Michigan, where Trump has taken the lead from Harris since last week. It's extremely close. He leads by 0.7 percentage points now. Trump has also taken a very slight lead in Pennsylvania, 0.3 percentage points. It was a tie there last week. And in North Carolina, Trump is ahead by 0.6 percentage points. There is a reason why these are the battleground states. That's all for Ion Politics this week. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Jack Fink. I am listening and we are listening on CBS News Texas. Hope to see you again next week. And from all of us here, have a great weekend.